Hello there, Cross Point Church. I hope everybody is doing well. Coming to you today uh, via podcasts. Just want to apologize that we won't be able to do an in person Bible study this week uh, due to a death in my wife's family. So, come to you today and excited that uh, you've decided to join us. If you have your Bible, get it out, get you something to write with, and we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 4. We've been in the book of Hebrews now for three going on four weeks, and so it's just a fascinating study of the Word of God. I hope you have uh, enjoyed it. I hope you're learning, and we're going to continue with chapter 4. This week, I'm going to do something a little bit different than I have been through the book of Hebrews. I'm going to read the entire chapter, and then we'll come back and discuss some key verses and uh, have some questions and then end in a word of prayer. So hopefully you have your Bible out. We're going to go ahead and get started. Hebrews chapter 4. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he has said. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience, again he designates a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time as it has been said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Let us, therefore, be diligent to enter into that rest, lest anyone fall, according to the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him, to whom we must give account. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And may God add a blessing to the reading of his word. Well, as we uh, get ready to start chapter 4, just to rehearse a little bit, uh, in chapter the previous chapters we have established that Jesus is superior in all ways, that he's superior to Judaism, that he's superior to angels. Last week we talked about how he is superior to Moses. And then towards the end of that chapter, there was a discussion about entering into God's rest. And the rest spoken of in chapter 3 referred to the promised land of the Jews, how that they would enter into that. And they did enter into it, but they never entered into his full rest. They never captured the whole of the promised land, uh, still had many battles to face, and so they never fully entered into that rest. But here in chapter 4, 
it begins to speak to us of a different kind of rest that we can have when we put our faith in Jesus Christ and not in our own works. So as we look at the first couple of verses, I need to remind you that the Hebrews who were receiving this letter were facing all types of persecution, trials, tribulations, and some of them, at least it was a concern of the writer, that were on the verge of turning back from their promised rest in Christ and reverting back to Judaism uh, as, a, as the people in Moses' day uh, turned back from the promised land and that they, they said they wanted to return to Egypt, but they never fully took God's promise and received it and inherited all of that land. So when we put our trust in our own efforts instead of in Christ's power, we're in danger of turning back, turning back to uh, self, turning back to our own efforts, uh, which is obviously never adequate. In uh, verse 2, we see that the Israelites of Moses' day knew a lot about Christ, but they did not know him personally. They never mixed their knowledge with faith. And that's a problem that we can have as well, as if we never mix our knowledge with faith, then we'll never grow in Christ. We'll never develop that deep relationship with him. In verse 4, it begins to talk some more about a God kind of rest, and that God rested himself on the seventh day, not because he was tired, because God doesn't get tired, but to indicate that creation was complete. It was finished. The world was perfect. He was satisfied with what had happened and what uh, it looked like and the creation of man and all of that. And hopefully one day when creation is renewed and restored and when every mark of sin is removed, then we'll also enjoy a perfect world again. So our rest as Christians begins when we trust in him to complete his good and perfect work in us. Philippians 1, 6 speaks of that. It says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now that's good news. No matter how long ago it was that God spoke, that God gave you a word, that he put a purpose and a plan in your heart, that God is going to complete it. He's the God of creation. He's the God who rested on the seventh day, so he will get the job done in your life. As we look at uh, verse 6 and 7, we're just going down through the chapter here a little bit at a time. We see that God gave Israel an opportunity to enter into the, the promised land, but they failed because they ultimately didn't put their full trust in him. They didn't believe that they could inherit the promised land. They didn't believe that they could defeat the giants or the people of that time uh, frame. And, you know, we too have an opportunity to come to the fullness of rest in Christ Jesus to enter into his ultimate rest. And notice here that it's saying that today, not tomorrow, all of us want to put it off to tomorrow. All of us want to say, I'll get to it eventually, but that today is the day that we need to make uh, a decision to follow after Christ wholeheartedly. Tomorrow could be a little too late. Scoot on down to about verse 11. It's instructing us there to cease from our own works. It doesn't mean to stop working for the Lord, that it's time to quit, but rather it means to stop counting ourselves righteous by what we do. It's not by what we do. I mean, if you have a great relationship with the Lord, you want to work for him, but it's not, not the opposite. We don't work for the Lord in order to have a, a righteous life and to have a great relationship with the Lord. We're to labor to enter into his rest. And that seems like a contradiction to labor in order to enter into his rest. But what it means is to faithfully seek him and his righteousness. The Bible tells us that if we'll seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all these things will be added to us. Now let's scoot down to verse 12. 
the Word of God, it begins to talk about the Word of God and the power. And I love to talk about the Word of God. God's called me to preach His Word and to teach His Word. And it's just so important. We emphasize it every Sunday. We emphasize it every uh, Wednesday about the Word of God having tr a transforming power in our lives. And here it begins to talk about the Word of God, and it says that it's living. You ever think about the Word of God being living? That it is alive, that it's life-changing, it's dynamic, and it doesn't just work in other people, it works in us. It reveals to us who we are and what we are and what we're not. It penetrates the core of our moral and our spiritual life. God's Word and exposure to God's Word requires us to make decisions. If we are more than readers of the Word but doers of the Word, it requires us uh, to make changes in our life. So we're not called to just listen to the Word of God, but we're called to let it shape our lives. In verse 13, it begins to talk about, and it's amazing how what I preached this past Sunday about being fully known yet fully loved, it comes up again in chapter uh, 4 of Hebrews telling us that nothing is hidden from God, that He knows about everyone everywhere. What I really think is important, though, is that He knows about me. He knows about you. He sees everything we do. He knows all we think. Even when we're unaware of His presence, He's still there. That's the best news that we can think about is that He knows us so deeply and so intimately. All of our faults, failures, all of our sins, if you would, He knows about all of those, yet He still loves us. That's probably the best news. It really is the message of the gospel. Finally, as we begin to head towards the end of the chapter, verse 14 here reemphasizes that Christ is our high priest. That in his day was the highest religious authority in the land, and especially in Judaism, that the high priest was the only one allowed to enter into the Holy of Holies. And then he only did it once a year to make atonement for the sins of the whole nation. And like the high priest, Jesus mediates between God and us. He literally comes between us. As a man, he represents us and intercedes for us before God. And as God's representative, he assures us of God's forgiveness, of his love for us, of his patience with us. How many need patience? Amen. We all do. Unlike the high priest, Jesus is always at God's right hand. He's always there. He's always there uh, representing us and being a representative for us. He's always available whenever we seek his face. Verse 15, as we uh, near the end of the chapter, begins to talk about that Jesus is like us. And many times we look at Jesus and we think, how can he be like us? How can he really understand us? But when we begin to realize that he was fully God, yet fully man, that he faced a full range of temptations as a human throughout his life, uh, we can be comforted to know that he can sympathize with us. You see, we have greater sympathy when we've been through something, when we've experienced it on our, either in our own life or in our family's life or someone close to us. We have a natural empathy and sympathy that we have uh, in those situations. Uh, we can be inspired uh, by the example of Christ as he faces those, he faced those temptations, but yet he did not sin. So Jesus understands our weaknesses and uh, he can give us strength to overcome them if we'll come to him and ask for his forgiveness. You know, many times I tell people when they're saved that the, the devil's going to come to them and say, how can God love somebody that's like you, that's constantly sinning and is constantly failing and facing all of these temptations? But Jesus was a man. Now, he did not sin, but he knows the temptation of sin. And so he, he knows us. And then finally, uh, verse 16, as we come to the end of the chapter, tells us that we can come to God's throne 
and it's a throne of grace. And we approach that throne not by our own merits because we uh, have sin in our life. We're not perfect, uh, but we can approach by reverence and assurance because of what Jesus has done, how his blood uh, makes a path, makes a way for us to have a restored relationship with God. You know, as we come to the Lord, we don't really, we don't have the ability to physically approach his throne like the high priest could, but we come to him through prayer. And I believe that God honors us when we pray to him and we come to him. And really, truthfully, I want to say that I think when we come to the Lord that we should remind him of his word, remind him of his promises. uh, And I believe that he's okay with it because he's a God of his word. And if we'll pray in his will, that we'll see uh, our prayers be answered. I hope you have enjoyed this time of Bible study. We do have uh, just a few questions. And uh, Pastor Jason is here with me as we record this. So, uh, Pastor Jason, do you have a question? Good question. So Pastor Jason's asking, how, you know, what do you say to someone who believes that the word of God is the only uh, way that people can be spoken to? I would have to take them to the word of God, I believe, and show them that the spirit speaks. Not too long ago, we uh, read a passage talking about the spirit still speaks, that it still talks, and uh, that you know, throughout the Bible, there were many times that people were spoken to through angels bearing messages. They were spoken to uh, by prophets. And at that point in time, it wasn't in the Bible yet. It wasn't written. Uh, So God speaks in many different ways. Uh, One of the ways that God speaks to us is, uh, you know, through the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. And he begins to prompt us and to push us to do the things uh, that God wants us to do. And the Holy Spirit comes to us. The Holy Spirit's at work all the time in our lives. Even right before we get saved, it's the Holy Spirit that draws us and tells us of God's love for us. And that, you know, if we'll just come to the Lord, that uh, he'll forgive us and and everything will be uh, made right. So I, I believe there's so many testimonies, you know, not only of people, but the Bible confirms that that. God speaks in many different ways. And, um, you know, through through the Spirit, through the Son, through the Father, uh, we see all of that being worked out in, in the Bible. So good question. Hopefully I answered that. That's a good question, and especially since you were right here, might as well ask that question. So we've got some other questions. I've got about six questions here for you. I'm going to try... When I send out the uh, link to the podcast, I'm going to include these questions with it, but we're going to go ahead and go through these uh, while I'm speaking. So question number one, the Jews heard the word, but what did they lack? Well, you see the answer for that in verse two, the word wasn't mixed with faith. So it doesn't do us any good to just literally hear the word, but that word needs to be mixed with faith. And that word is inherently powerful, but it needs to be mixed with faith in order to be realized and for the promises of God to come true in our life. So he's saying that the Israelites who didn't cross over into the promised land They heard it, but they didn't mix it with faith, and so therefore they weren't able to move forward into God's plan. Question number two, what did God cease from as he rested on the seventh day of creation? According to verse four, it tells us that he ceased from all his works. So all those works of creation that God did, 
uh, creating the sun and the moon, the stars, the trees, the animals, even mankind, his crowning work of creation, God ceased from all of his works on the seventh day, giving us really a great example, uh, not only that we should rest physically at times, but that it's not about our works because Jesus has already completed the work of salvation for us. And we work not to be saved, but we work because we are saved. All right, question number three. List all the qualities and actions of the Word of God found in verse 12. Well, the qualities of the Word of God listed there is that it is living, that it is powerful. And that word powerful is interesting. It literally means active, So, and that it is sharp. So when we begin to think about the Word of God, it's like a two-edged sword. It's sharp on both sides. And then finally, what actions are associated with the Word of God? It says that it's piercing, that it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of our heart. And so when we begin to think about the Word of God, uh, it just comes alive to us as we begin to read it and the Holy Spirit brings it to life. All right, question number four. How do all things, even our thoughts and intent and intents, appear before the Lord. According to verse 13, and again, this is, relates to what I preached Sunday, it says that all things are naked and open to the eyes of God. God sees it all. Uh, we can't hide it from him. We can't hide, hide ourselves as Adam and Eve tried to do, uh, but we're open and naked before the Lord. Question number five, how are we to come to Jesus when we are in need? According to verse 16, it tells us that we can come boldly to the throne of grace. And as we look at that question, you know, we don't come brashly. We don't come irreverently. As a matter of fact, that word boldly doesn't speak of that, but it speaks of, uh, of our ability to, to come with confidence before God, not confidence in ourself, but confidence in that the sacrifice of Jesus and his blood, that it was, that it pays the way, it paves the way for us to be able to enter into God's presence. So we can come boldly because Jesus, our uh, savior, Jesus, our big brother has already made the way for us. And then finally, question number six. How can we be sure that he will understand us and understand our situation? According to verse 15 in chapter 4, uh, also 18 in chapter 2, uh, it tells us that Jesus can sympathize because he was also tempted like us, that he was a man, he didn't succumb to those temptations, but he faced those and uh, he understands our plight as a man. And so uh, he can sympathize with us. Not only does he sympathize with us, but in the book of John, it tells us that he ever liveth to make intercession for us and to pray for us. There in the book of John, it tells us literally there's a prayer that is recorded uh, where Jesus prays not only for his disciples then, but for us. And so that's exciting to know uh, that, you know, we can have someone praying for us, even when it feels like nobody's praying for us, that Jesus is doing that. So hope you've enjoyed this today. We're going to end with a word of prayer. And I believe that the word of God uh, is going to minister to you as you just uh, receive it in. It'll grow you in your spirit. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We know that it is sharp, that it is piercing. Uh, Lord, that it understands the, our thoughts and in, intents. And Lord, we ask that this word would just come alive in our hearts, in our lives. God, that it would uh, just change us, transform us to be more like you. Lord, help us to be witnesses of you and uh, help us to, ju God, just walk through those doors of opportunity that you have opened to understand that we need to 
not go through those doors or try to go through those doors that you have closed, God, but to just walk with you uh, and to walk in faith. We give you praise for it. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, amen. God bless you. God keep you. God cause his face to shine upon you and give you peace. We'll see you next time.